This is the issue, and I am the Ghetto Man. Today's issue, martial law. What is martial law anyway? Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Our constitutional republic is now in the final stages of destruction. Democracy has taken its toll. Contention and chaos replaces law and order. Police are on the take, violating the inalienable rights of the sovereign citizen. The legislature is creating and passing more and more unjust laws. Corrupt lawyers corrupt lawyers becoming judges, then judges corrupt. Wrong is right, and right is wrong. Everything's perverted. People, they're filled with injustice, depravity, greed, and evil. Full of envy, murder, strife, and deceit. Foul-mannered, Defamers, sinister leftist Democrat communists that hate everything that our republic was founded upon. Spiteful inventors of vice, living senseless lives, treacherous in their actions, doing that which is unnatural, merciless. Yes, all righteousness is gone from the land, but a righteous fire still burns. It burns in the heart of the patriot. It's the fire of liberty, the burning desire to be free from the vile stench of an irreversibly corrupt, tyrannical government. The patriot prepares for the battle to purge the land of an ungodly filth. He prepares with food, water, and, of course, guns. He takes refuge in the word of the Bible. He holds the promise of freedom close to his heart while donned in Yahweh's armor. armor. The stage is set. Civil war is in the air. A coup d'etat is at hand. The beast rears back and roars, the new world order will reign supreme. Who, who will challenge the beast? Arrogantly, the beast waits. It waits for the insignificant rebellion to begin so it can claim its prize, the United States of America. The beast is already in control of its prize. The beast has complete control of everything. But it wants to engage in battle anyway. To demonstrate what? Its superiority. It has carefully placed its warriors in each branch of the government. Its agents control our public schools and they control the news media. Nothing, nothing is said that doesn't meet with the beast's approval. The beast has all of the necessary laws in place, laws that are to be used to imprison anyone, anyone who would dare oppose the beast's United Nations and its new world order. 
The tension builds. Tempers rise until violence explodes. There are riots in the streets. Gunfire. The Civil War has begun. With an iron fist, the beast strikes, declaring that the United States is under martial law and the Constitution is now suspended. The will of the military is now the law. There are military arrests, summary trials, and the prompt execution and sentence. The whole land becomes one gigantic prison camp. And the law of the camp is now the law of the land. Now, can the federal government declare martial law and nullify the Constitution of the United States? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> can a state government declare martial law and nullify its state constitution? With the state of affairs that our nation is in today, it is extremely important that each and every citizen in this nation know and understand what the government can do and cannot do pursuant to law governing martial law. Now, in order to gain a proper understanding of this most important subject, a complete understanding of the history surrounding martial law must be explored. So, what is martial law anyway? Well, martial law is defined in Black's Law Dictionary as follows. Martial law exists when military authorities carry on government, or exercise various degrees of control over civilians or civilian authorities in a domestic territory. Such may exist either in time of war or when civil authority has ceased to function or has become ineffective. A system of law obtaining only in time of actual war and growing out of the exigencies thereof, arbitrary in this in character, and depending only on the will of the commander of an army, which is established and administered in a place or district of hostile territory held in belligerent possession, or sometimes in places occupied or pervaded by insurgents or mobs, and which suspends all existing civil laws, as well as the civil authority, and the ordinary administration of justice. <clears throat> wow, that's a mouthful. In order to understand the constitutional limitations placed on a state of martial law, we must look at the historical events that led to the foundation of our constitutional republic. The history of martial law goes back a long way. It can be found in almost every page of our nation's Anglo-Saxon history since 1682. Now, prior to 1682, the British Crown, on various occasions, attempted to extend the operation of martial law, either, apply, either by applying it in uh, time of peace or, in non, or to non-military persons or non-military offenses. The issuance of... Um, of a commission by James I and Charles I to proceed under martial law for the purpose of not only to maintain discipline of the army, but also for bringing to a more speedy punishment of any crimes whatsoever in nature that may be committed by civilians of a certain class is what fueled the fire that led to the historic petition of rights. In a debate which occurred in the House of Commons at that time, the right to proclaim martial law was discussed in its entirety. The views of the great historians like Raleigh and Koch clearly reflect that the uh, necessity and the limitations of the use and power of martial law. Martial law is merely for necessity when the common law cannot take place. If an enemy come into any part where the common law cannot be executed, there may be martial law, be executed. If, if a subject be taken in rebellion, 
if he not be slain at the time of his rebellion, he is to be tried afterwards and by the common law. Okay, 50 years later, Sir Matthew Hale insisted that martial law is not a law, but something indulged rather than allowed as law. The necessity of government, order, and discipline in an army is that only which can give it continence. Secondly, this indulged law is only to extend to members of the army and to those of the opposite army and never be, excuse me, may never may be so much indulged as to be exercised or executed upon others. Thirdly, the exercise of martial law may not be permitted in times of peace when the king's courts are open. This comes from the history of common law. Uh, Chapter 11, okay. Now, martial law, this is really important that we, uh, that we stop here just for one moment. Martial law cannot, under any circumstances, nullify the United States Constitution. Its only function is to make sure that the civil law is able to operate pursuant constitutional mandate. Nothing more. It's very important to remember that. Because these words, these words are echoed by uh, illustration by Blackstone, for whom we may always learn the state of the common law at the time our Constitution was adopted. First Hammonds. Um, Blackstone, page uh, 695. Sorry about that. Nor has there, excuse me, nor has any other view ever prevailed among the jurists and publicists of England. In Grant versus Gold, Lord Lorenborough, Lorenborough, why can I say that? L O U G H B O R O U H, Lowborough said, and I quote, martial law such as described by Hale, and such also as it is marked by Mr. Justice, Blackstone, does not exist in England at all. Now, it's important to note that martial law has not been proclaimed in England since 1689, neither in the uh, Jacobite uh, Risings nor in the Gordon Riots of the 18th century, nor in uh, the disturbance which occurred at various times in the 19th century. It's true that in Ireland in 1798 and in the uh, different British colonies since then, martial law has been proclaimed on several occasions and the right to do so has been the subject of much parliamentary discussion. The prevalent view in these discussions seems to have been the same as expressed by Lord Cardwell on the Jamaica Troubles of 1807. He said that, quote, while there was properly no such thing as martial law, there was no doubt a law of necessity which required that certain acts should be done for the suppression of the rebellion, but not for the punishment of the persons concerned in it. The law of necessity to which he had referred was strictly limited in time and operated only for repression and not for punishment. Okay, the above views were strongly enforced in 1867 by Justice Blackburn in Queens versus Erie and by uh, Chief Justice Cockburn in Queens versus Nelson. Martial law cannot replace the supreme law of the land. It cannot replace the United States Constitution. It cannot, as the presidents of the United States today would have you believe, impose upon the American people, quote, a state of siege. You know, similar to what took place with Randy Weaver in Idaho and uh, uh, in uh, Waco, Texas, where in the... uh, constitutional guarantees of the persons under siege are totally suspended and the um, resistors then, in the case of the Branch Davidians, put to death. 
Now, Professor Dicey commented on this type of siege in England as follows, quote, This kind of martial law is in England utterly unknown to the Constitution. Soldiers may press a riot, excuse me, soldiers may suppress a riot, as they may resist an invasion, but may fight rebels just as they might fight foreign en enemies. But they have not right under the law to inflict punishment for the riot or rebellion. Dicey Law of the Constitution, page 381. If, under a state of martial law, the military forces cannot inflict punishment for riot or rebellion or any other offenses against the permissible law, what can they do? Okay, turning, our, uh, turning to our own country, specifically when the Constitution uh, was adopted, the common law on the subject was as stated by Justice Blackstone. There was a very keen appreciation and jealousy on the part of the Founding Fathers concerning their personal rights, a jealousy which had been directed, in part, to the very subject of martial law by the acts of General Gage in New England and of Governor uh, DeMore of Virginia. It is also common knowledge that when our national constitution was submitted to the people, over one-third of the vote was against it. And many of the uh, favorable votes received were cast uh, with much misgiving. Why? Because the document did not put in positive terms the safeguards to which the people, quote, had long been accustomed to have been interposed between them and the magistrate who exercised sovereign power. Madison Annals, First Congress, page 450. The uh, explanation given to the people by those who created the document was that the Constitution was a grant of power, and therefore any power not expressly granted to the national government were reserved to the people. Quote, this explanation satisfies not one state, and as a result of the Bill of Rights, excuse me, as a result of the Bill of Rights, was uh, added to the National Constitution, though there would be, there would not be any, there would be no way that anybody could misunderstand as to what the powers were granted to the national government by the people. And that's out of Brancroft's history of the formation of the Constitution, and you can find that on page 383 and so on. Um, this attitude was expressed by Jefferson, who, after extolling the merits of the new plan, added, quote, I will now tell uh, what I do not like. First, the omission of, of the Bill of Rights providing clearly and without aid of sophism and, uh, or sophism um, uh, for freedom of, of religion, freedom of the press, protection against standing armies, restriction of monopolies, the internal and unremitting force of the habeas corpus and trial by jury in all matters of fact, triable by the laws of the land and not by the laws of nations. And we talked about the laws of nations or would be similar to our United Nations, and that can be found in two Jefferson works, uh, page 239. Now, remember, the United Nations is now set in parallel with what was referred to at one time the Law of Nations, as referred to in Jefferson's writing. These two entities today are, in fact, the same. Now, eight states coupled their assent with the demand for a Bill of Rights and insisted that the right to a trial by jury should be guaranteed in each case, then trialable by a jury at the common law. Since the common law and let me back up for a second here. Common law basically is the, if, if I were going to put it in layman's terms, the uh, common law is just the common customs and practices of the people of that day. It doesn't even necessarily have to be written down. In, in most cases, it's not written down. It's just everybody understands that this is a law, this is the way we do things. People have a right to a trial by jury and, jury and that sort of thing. 
Well, since the common law did not authorize violations of the laws of the land to be tried by military commission, it followed that the guarantee of a trial by jury is contained in Amendment 6 must be taken in the, in the sense. There has not been one case adjudicated in our nation that has allowed a citizen to be tried under military tribunal under martial law. All of the cases in point follow the case of Smith v. Shaw, 12 Johns, New York, page 257, which arose out of an arrest uh, for a trial by court martial during the War of 1812 in the Supreme Court of New York in disposing of an attempt to or attempted plea of justification under martial law said, quote, it is a general rule that where such a court has neither jurisdiction of the subject matter nor of the person, everything done is absolutely void. None of the offenses charged against Shaw were cognizable by a court martial except that which related to his being a spy. And if he was an American citizen, he could not be charged with such an offense. He might be amenable to a civil authority for treason, but could not be punished under martial law as a spy. There was, therefore, a one of jurisdiction, either of the person or of the subject matter, as to all the offenses alleged against the plaintiff, unquote. Now, in Johnson versus Duncan, uh, that's, uh, boy, that's an old case, isn't it? There's Duncan, uh, 3 Mart OS, Louisiana, page 530. I'd have to really hunt that one up again. I remember getting that, but that was years ago. Anyway, the Supreme Court of Louisiana, touching uh, uh, the matter of martial law that arose out of the declaration by uh, General Jackson of martial law in the city of New Orleans, declared, quote, if it be said that the laws of war, being the laws of the United States, authorized a proclamation of martial law, I answer in place or in war no law can be enacted but by the legislative power. Unquote. The next war that was fought upon our soil was the Great Rebellion. And as might have been expected, it gave rise to much controversy and discordance opinion touching the scope and the power of martial law. All this, however, was set at rest by the benchmark decision of the Supreme Court of the United States in the Mulligan case, wherein the court stated as follows, quote, The Constitution of the United States is a law for rulers and people, equally in war and in peace, and covers with its covers with the shield of its protection all classes of men at all times and under all circumstances. No doctrine involving more pernicious consequences was ever invented by the wit of man that, than that any of its provisions can be suspended during any time the great agencies of government. Every trial involves the exercise of judicial power. And from what source did the military commission that tried him derive their authority? Certainly no part of the judicial power of the country was conferred upon them because the Constitution expressly vests it in one Supreme Court and such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. And it is not pretended that the commission was a court ordained and established by Congress. They cannot justify on the uh, mandate of the president because he is controlled by law and has his appropriate sphere of duty, which is to execute, not to make the laws. And therefore is no unwritten, therefore is no unwritten criminal code to which resort can be had as a source of jurisdiction. Why was he not delivered to the circuit court of Indiana before proceeding against him according to law? And no reason of necessity could be urged against it because Congress has declared penalties against the offenses charged, provided for their punishment, and directed that the court hear 
and determine them. If it was dangerous in the distracted condition of affairs to leave Mulligan unrestrained on his liberty because he conspired against the government, afforded aid and comfort to rebels, and incited the people with insurrection, the law said arrest him, confine him closely, render him powerless to do further mischief, and then present his case to the grand jury of the district with proofs of his guilt, and if indicted, try him according to the course of the common law. If this had been done, the Constitution would have been vindicated, the law of 1863 enforced, and the securities for personal liberty preserved and defended. Another guarantee of freedom was broken when Mulligan was denied a trial by jury. The great minds of the country have differed on the correct interpretation to be given to various provisions of the federal constitution, and judicial decision has been often invoked to settle their true meaning. But until recently, no one ever doubted that the right of a trial by jury was forfeited in the organic law against the power of attack. It is now assailed. But if ideas can be expressed in words and language has any meaning, it's right, this right, one of the most valuable in a free country, is preserved to everyone accused of a crime who is not attached to the army or the navy or militia in time of actual service. All other persons, citizens of states, where the courts are open if charged with a crime, are guaranteed the inestimable privilege of a trial by jury. This privilege is vital, is a vital principle underlying the whole administration of criminal justice. It is not, it is not held by sufferance and cannot be frittered away on any plea of state or political necessity. See, it is claimed that martial law covers with its broad uh, mantle of proceedings of this military commission. The proposition is this, that in a time of war, the commander of an armed force, if in his opinion the excellencies of the country demand it, and of which he is to judge, has the power within the lines of his military district to spend all civil rights and their remedies and subject citizens as well as soldiers to the rule of his will and in the execute of his lawful authority cannot be restrained except by superior officer or the president of the United States. If this position is sound to the extent claimed, then when war exists, foreign or domestic, and the country is, in, is subdivided into uh, military departments for mere convenience, the commander of one of them can, if he chooses, within the limits of the plea of necessity, with the approval of the executive, substitute military force for and to the exclusion of the laws and punish all persons as he thinks right and proper without fixed or certain rules. The statement of this proposition shows its importance for, if true, Republican government is a failure and there is an end of liberty regulated by law. Martial law established on such a basis destroys every guarantee of the Constitution and effectively renders the military independent of and superior to the civil power. The attempt to do which, by the King of Great Britain, was deemed by our fathers such an offense that they assigned it to the world as one of the causes which impelled them to declare their independence. Civil liberty and this kind of martial law cannot endure together. The antagonism is irreconcilable. And in the co conflict, one or more or the other must perish. Unquote. There is nothing in our nation's history 
or in our law today, that breaks the force of the Milligan's decision. It is believed by those running our government today that under all the decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States, the executive can establish martial law in time of war when the ordinary tribunals are not open. It is also their belief that an insurrection is war. And that's not true. When the laws of the land in a domestic territory have become suspended, not by executive proclamation, but by the existence of war, the executive may supply deficiency by such form of martial law as the situation requires. But only in war, not in insurrection. War and insurrection are not convertible terms. The term war, in its legal sense, can only be recognized and declared by an act of Congress. War is an act of sovereignty, really assumed. Insurrection is not. War makes enemies of the inhabitants of a contending states, but insurrection does not put beyond the pale of the friendship the innocent in the affected district. War creates the rights and duties of a belligerency, which to a mere insurrection are unknown. Doubtless an insurrection may become war, as was the case with the Great Rebellion, but it does not become war, or does not become so, in the legal sense, until the rebellious party assumes a political form. This was pointed out by the Supreme Court of the United States in the prize cases, two black, uh, 635, 637. You find that in 17 Lawyers Edition, page 459. Quote, In organizing this rebellion, they have acted as states claiming to be sovereign over all persons and property within their respected limits and asserting a right to absolve their citizens from their allegiance to the federal government. Several of these states have combined to form a new confederacy claiming to be acknowledged by the world as a sovereign state. It is no loose, unorganized insurrection, having no defined boundary or possession. It has a boundary marked by lines of bayonets and which can be crossed only by force. South of this line is enemy's territory because it is claimed and held in possession by an organized hostile and belligerent power, unquote. Now today we have in control of our constitutional republic a warring, warring factor that is attempting to conquer our nation from within. It is an organization, host, a hostile belligerent power that has assumed political form. It promotes and imposes on the people of this nation a form of government that is foreign to our constitutional republic and foreign to the Bill of Rights. It's called democracy. Yeah, democracy. Those that oppose our nation's republican form of government have declared an internal war against the citizens of the United States of America and are destroying our nation from within. In an internal war, the uh, object is to coerce the power opposed to the sovereign, and because such power exercised jurisdiction and control de facto, meaning in fact, indeed, actually, and claims it de jure of right over the territory under its sway, it is competent for the sovereign to exercise powers belonging to the belligerent at international law. That can be found in Miller's versus United States, Levin Wall, 268. Um, and uh, we'll discuss internal war in a future article and how it's, it is the duty of the militia to purge our nation of any coercive advantages against our constitutional republic uh, from a domestic enemy. Okay, the laws pertaining to war are clearly inapplicable against a formless, a formless insurrection. 
Unless there is a clear organized political form that has a goal contrary to the United States Constitution and or the constitutions of the individual states, there cannot, there cannot be a state of war and the president is without lawful authority to engage military force under such false pretenses. This is clearly pointed out by Mr. Justice Nelson in the prize cases as follows, quote, It has been argued that the authority conferred upon the president by the Act of 1795 invests him with the, the war power. It, uh, but the obvious answer is that it proceeds from a different clause in the Constitution and for which is given for different purposes and objects, namely to execute the laws and preserve the public order and tranquility of the country in a time of peace by preventing or suppressing any public disorder or disturbance by foreign or domestic enemies. Certainly, if there is any force in the argument, then we are in a state of war with all of the rights of war and all the penal consequences attending tending it. Every time this power is exercised by calling out a military force to execute the laws or suppress insurrection or rebellion, for the nature of the power cannot depend upon the numbers called out. The truth is this idea of existence of any necessity for clothing the president with the war power under the Act of 1795 is simply a monstrous exaggeration, unquote. See, it was, the, it was also the uh, general belief when the Sixth Amendment to the National Constitution was under consideration that a trial by jury could not be denied on account of any mere local disturbance. This is evidenced by the fact that in the first draft of that amendment, as presented by... Uh, Madison, in the second draft, as is presented by a congressional committee of the 11, and in the third draft, as reported by the special committee of eight, provision was specifically made for trials by jury out of Vic in age, when the Vic in age should be a state of insurrection. Okay, that's Thorpe's Constitutional History, U.S., Volumes Two pages one ninety nine. Okay, so far as the uh, the right to a trial by jury in case of insurrection is concerned, it is not important whether the courts are or are not in open when the military appear. It may be granted that the courts, which are prevented by the insurrection from ex exercising or excuse me executing their process, are not open in contemplation of the law. To open them open the courts, is part of the duty devolving upon the military. So that's their, their duty. Their duty is to stop the insurrection, make sure that the, that the, uh, the courts and, the, and all the uh, civil government is operating as, as it normally would. Martial law, martial law is of all grad, graduations and the commander and chief of either the state or the United States cannot, they cannot by proclamation or otherwise establish martial law unless it protects the constitutional rights of the citizen of the nation. He must only declare it as he's constitutionally authorized. He is only authorized to, de to detail the militia, to suppress an insurrection, and to direct their movements without regard to civil authorities and they could, in, in performance of their work, take such measures as might be necessary, including the arrest and detention of the insurrectionists and other violations, violators of the law, but only for delivery to the civil authorities. But neither the commander-in-chief nor the military under him can lawfully punish for insurrection or for other violations of the law. The courts cannot be ousted by the agencies detailed to aid them, nor can their functions be transferred to tribunals unknown to the Constitution. 
So in a nutshell, martial law can only be used so to suppress the insurrection or the rebellion and to restore civil order so that those responsible will be dealt with in a manner prescribed by law pursuant to the Constitution of each state and of the United States. Okay, so as you can clearly see from uh, you know, the information that I presented in this show, that if and when the, uh, the uh, government decides to declare martial law, and we've had de- martial law declared Butte, Montana, uh, one time back when the miners uh, rebelled, and there were cases that went up before the state Supreme Court in regards to whether or not these people could be tried in uh, a military tribunal or not. And the state Supreme Court made it very clear, and I think the case was uh, uh, Ex Parte McDonald, where he uh, petitioned the Supreme Court, you know, because his constitutional rights to due process were being violated by the military. And so the state upheld the very same thing, you know, that once the insurrection has been suppressed and the courts are open and we can get back to a normal uh, daily routine of, of justice, then the people have to be turned over and, and tried within those, those jurisdictions. But see, what I think a lot of people are concerned with, and I think rightly so, is that if they, if they don't understand how martial law works and what the limitations are, that there really is no such thing as martial law. It's, it's an indulgence, something that you have to do in order to get you know, the, the uh, civil government and get order uh, things running the way they should be run. And then, of course, take care of those who were, you know, acting illegally and caused the the uh, uprising. So it's very important to understand that so that if they declare martial law and they say the Constitution is suspended, the military, the president is suspended, they can't suspend it. The Constitution can be never, never suspended by them. And you really have to understand that. So the moment they say that, you know that they're going way too far. They're going beyond what they have a right to do under martial law. You can't suspend the Constitution. All they can do is round up the people that were involved. Of course, they, the military has a right to defend themselves against anybody that starts shooting at them. But, uh, you know, they, they, all their, uh, their legally, the only legal right that they have or the legal duty that they have is to make sure that they su- suppress the insurrection or rebellion. And... Um, Take it from there. So we have talked about the Democratic Party, and I, I use the Democratic Party. I should say left, but the Democratic Party is representative of the entire left, although the left does extend into the Republican Party. It's the uh, the rhinos, the uh, Republicans in, in name only, and those people who still support all the communist left things, uh, leftist um, uh, ideologies. So, you know, I, when I pick on the Democratic Party, I'm, uh, the, the entire party, Democratic Party, is completely, you know, they're they're trying to overthrow the United States Constitution. They say it in their, their you know, they're, they're Democrats, and if you, uh, we support democracy, and if they support democracy, then of course anybody that supports democracy, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's it's prima facie evidence that you're a traitor because we are not a democracy, and. Uh, we're a republic, and if you don't like it, you can, you can just leave. You don't have a right to sit here and try to overthrow it and then use your leftist counterparts in the Republican Party as well. So anyway, that's, uh, that's a rundown of um, martial law. It's, I thought I, it was something I thought I needed to discuss because we hear that term a lot now in the, uh, in the, um, with the lamestream media and the news. They're starting to talk about, you know, possibility of martial law so now you know what it is you know what uh, the limitations are what government can and cannot do so when it happens hopefully you'll be able to um, be able to take the proper position and um, help educate your neighbors and let them know that they they can't just uh, suspend the constitution and uh, put an end to everything but anyway uh, if you're politically correct then you're legally wrong. And if you're not part of the solution, then you are the problem. I am the ghetto man, and I want to thank you for watching. I'm the child of the universe, free to be who I am. The laws of nature guide me and show me how to be my own man. My life belongs to me. This you'll have to understand.
of you. So step aside or we'll come.